will normally do. I'm not really going to have any sort of you know vast application for your life for this week. I apologize for that. Uh, you're going to have to find that elsewhere. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, I want to dive deep into the Bible, and I want to show you that every word, every syllable, every letter in the Bible matters, and that you can learn something from even those things that you feel like you can't sometimes. Those things that almost you know, uh, uh, feel as if they're mind-numbing. They're like, why are these in there? I'm going to be going over Bible names. We're going to be going over different names in the Bible. And the title of the sermon is Bible Names Defined by the Bible. Bible Names Defined by the Bible. Now, the Bible is our final authority. If I want to get a definition, I don't even go to a dictionary because now the dictionary has become the authority. Now this dictionary is interpreting what the Bible actually means. The Bible has its own built-in dictionary. The Bible is a divine book. It is breathed from the mouth of God. I believe that it is God's very words. And when we study it, we can find answers for things. We can learn things. We can grow in knowledge and in wisdom. And we as Christians are commanded to study the Bible. I want you to look with me here at 2 Timothy chapter number 2. <clears throat> Look at verse number 15. The Bible says this. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I want you to notice that this is not a suggestion. This is a commandment. There's many commandments in the Bible, and this is one of them. We are commanded as Christians not only to read our Bibles, but also to study our Bibles. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God. So we want to be approved by God. We want to have God's approval. It says this, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. So notice that the opposite of the person that maybe is approved by God. The other man is a man that would be ashamed. This is a man that would not be approved by God and he would be ashamed before God. We need to study so that we can rightly divide the word of truth. So it is a commandment. Notice it's work too. He says, the workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Flip over to 2 Timothy chapter number 3 as well. And I want to show you, because somebody may try to critique a sermon like this, like, hey, that's a waste of time. Nothing in the Bible is a waste of time. Every ounce of it, every letter, every word, everything is there for a reason. And all of those names in the Bible that maybe you have issues pronouncing, that maybe you have no idea what they mean, why are they there? You know, like Isaiah's son, Meher, Shalal, Hashbaz, you're like, what in the world is this, right? You can learn from all of this. It teaches you things. And I'm going to show you that tonight that you actually have, and this is going to be, this is extremely interesting. I love these types of sermons when other people will preach them. I love this subject of just how deep the Bible is. And not only that, how the Bible will define itself and how you can web it together and connect it together. And we don't need another book. I want you to walk away, and that can be your application. Walk away tonight and know that, that everything that you need to learn something inside of this book is also found inside of this book. You don't need external resources. What you need is the Bible and the Bible alone. Uh, so I want you to go with me now. Let's begin in uh, Jeremiah chapter number 27. We're going to have a lot of turning tonight. I'll give you, I'm going to give you a few points also and you can write these points down. Uh, Jeremiah chapter number 27 is where we're going to begin. And uh, as I said, we're studying names in the Bible. And I want you to, uh, one thing that I want you to know, I want you to understand first, uh, a good point, is that there are var variations in names. There are variations in name. It will be talking about the same person, and it's technically the same name, but there will be slight variations within that name. Now, we don't do this often today. You know, it's, it's, you know, your name is either, you know, Tyler or it's Josh, and there really isn't a variation of those names today. You won't, you know, one person won't call you a slight, you know, a slightly different, with a slightly different nuance, Josh, you know. Uh, maybe you could consider Joshua and Josh, right? But those are, you know, a contraction, really, of that. But I want you to look here with Jeremiah chapter number 27, verse number 6. I want you to uh, uh, notice how there are variations just within a few chapters. And it's the same exact person, and there's a variation within his name. Look at Jeremiah 27, verse 6. It says this, And now I have given, and now have I given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And the beasts of the field have I given him also to serve him. Now, most people here probably heard of Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king of Babylon, right? He's a well-known character. You may or may not have heard of him, uh, but he, uh, he's mentioned in the Old Testament many times. I want you to go now back to Jeremiah chapter number 25. Jeremiah chapter number 25. Je uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar also ha is, is referred to by the name Nebuchadrezzar. Now this is the same man. 
So ultimately, it's really the same name, just a variation within his name, just spelled just slightly different. So I want you to understand and acknowledge when studying the Bible and studying names that names will have variations. They'll, they'll slightly be different sometimes. There'll be little nuances that are different. It's talking about the same person, but it's just a, a little difference in the name. Look at Jeremiah 25, verse 9. It says, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord. And then it says, And Nebuchadrezzar, notice that, Nebuchadrezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. So notice how it was Nebuchadnezzar in Jeremiah 27, 6, but here he's referred to as what? Nebuchadrezzar. So this is very common and very often in the Bible where there will, it will be talking about the same person but they will just make, make a small change to their name. Now, uh, we don't do this today as I said, but if you've ever read any writings from our founding fathers, if you've ever read any writings from you know, maybe the 18th century is really when this took place, it kind of phased out after that. I read something by George Washington once and uh, I noticed that repeatedly he was just spelling words differently. The same word, he would repeat the same word, you know, and be using that word in different sentences, and he would maybe leave out an I. And he's doing this purposely because he did it with multiple words. He would leave out an I one time instead of I, E, something, he would just leave the I out and only have the E, and that was the part of the word that actually makes the sound. And he would have these, these different nuances uh, within his, his uh, writings. So I want you to go now with me to Jeremiah chapter number 1. Jeremiah chapter number 1. Jeremiah chapter number 1. And I'm going to show you that this is also, this is also something that uh, is going to take place from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's going to take place from the Old Testament to the New Testament where there will be variations within names within the, the same writing. So here, uh, uh, I'm going to give you two reasons why this takes place in just a moment. Jeremiah chapter number 1, the Bible says, The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. Now, uh, go to the New Testament with, you, with me, I'm sorry. Matthew chapter number 16. Let's go to Matthew chapter number 16. It's the first book in the New Testament. Matthew chapter number 16. One of the reasons why the variation takes place is because they're two different languages. That's one of the reasons. It's because the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and the New Testament was written in Greek. So there's a variation, of course, when you go from one language to the next. It's like, uh, you know, uh, uh, Pedro and Peter, same name. So these, uh, there's this slight variation here. So I want you to look with me at Matthew chapter 16, look at verse 14. The Bible says, And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others... Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now there, Jeremiah, that's referring to Jer Jeremiah. Now go with me to Matthew chapter number 2, verse number 17. This gets even more interesting. And this is the same exact uh, um, thing that took place in the book of Jeremiah just a moment ago. Look at uh, Matthew chapter number 2, verse number 17. It says this, <clears throat> Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, and then it quotes, if you look up the quotation, it's a quotation from Jeremiah. So I want you to notice that even within the book of Matthew also, just like we saw in the book of Jeremiah, we see Jeremiah actually being referred to as Jeremiah and Jeremy. So these are all three the same name. Jeremy, Jeremiah, and, and uh, uh, Jeremiah. These are all three the same name. These are just variations within those names. I'm kind of building a foundation for you. This happens repeatedly. Go to Matthew chapter number 3, verse number 3. Isaiah of the Old Testament in the New Testament is known as Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 1 says, The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and so forth and so forth. Now if we look at Matthew chapter 3 verse 3, which is right there where you was, where you were, I'm sorry, it says this, For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, and then it quotes, The voice of one crying in the wilderness. That is a quotation from Isaiah. And he is here referred to as Isaiah. So what we can do is, and this is a, a big Bible tip, this is something we can learn from, is we can compare on, uh, Old Testament quotations. And, and uh, this works not only with names, but this is very important. When you, when you come across a quote in the New Testament, when you come across a quote in the New Testament, make sure that you look that quote up in the Old Testament and you can learn things from it. Obviously, this is how we can get the definition uh, in Hebrews chapter 2, uh, where it says, in the midst of the 
church, I will sing praise unto thee. And then the Old Testament, in, in Psalm 2, it says, in the midst of the congregation, I will sing praise unto thee. So we can get the definition of the word church. And what does it mean? It means congregation. This also happens with the word assembly. The word assembly is used interchangeably when it quotes the Old Testament. Uh, it actually is quoting, again, congregation, but it uses the word assembly in the New Testament. Uh, so you'll see different words that are used when quotations will take place. And we can also do this with names. We can also do this with names. This takes place many different times or numerous other people. Jonah is another example of this. Jonah, Jonas. Eli Elijah of the Old Testament is referred to as Elias in the New Testament. So these are all good things to know. Uh, Hosea, you know the book of Hosea of the Old Testament. He's called Osi. O, it's spelled O-S-E-E -E in the New Testament. So uh, there are many different prophets and things like that. You have also uh, Judah who in the New Testament is referred to as Judas. So, uh, also here's another tip that, that goes in with, uh, you know, looking up quotations. Genealogies. If you are specifically studying names, the same genealogies are mentioned at different parts in the Bible. You have genealogies mentioned in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter number 5. Those same genealogies are again mentioned in 1 Chronicles. And then they are also mentioned, many of them, uh, many of those same people are mentioned in the book of Matthew and in the book of Luke. So what you can do is you can look up these different genealogies and compare them side by side. And if you do so, you'll notice, as I just said, that Judah of the Old Testament, who's referred to as Judah, if you look at Matthew 1, his name appears as Judas. His name actually comes up as Judas. So you can see that the name Judas means Judah. It means Judah. So we now know, you know, that Judas in the New Testament it has the same name as Judah of the Old Testament. Just a slight variation. And there are consistencies here. You'll notice that the H drops every time and an S comes up. Jeremiah, the H is gone in the New Testament and it's Jeremiah S, right? Isaiah, right? And then in the New Testament, what is it? I don't know how I'm blanking on this. Isaiah, right, Isaiah. That first part with the E threw me off for a minute. Isaiah, right? So you'll see Isaiah in the New Testament. The H drops off. Jonah, Jonas, right? So there's these consistencies here that you can see over and over again. So uh, this is a major tip when studying names, specifically compare genealogies. But just in general, make sure that you look up quotes when you see these quotes. And that's basically what a genealogy is. It's very similar to that. So here's another example. This is a very important example, the name Jesus. I want you to go to Matthew chapter number 1 verse number 21. We're told what the name Jesus means. <clears throat> the name Jesus. <clears throat> Matthew chapter number 1. Look at verse number 21. The Bible says this, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. So his name is going to be Jesus. And then notice this, it says for. Now that means because. For he shall save his people from their sins. So notice there that he's called Jesus. And notice the, the reason why is because he's going to save his people from their sins. And the name Jesus means Jehovah saves. It's referring to the fact that he is the Savior. He is the Savior of all mankind. It means Jehovah saves. Flip over to Hebrews chapter number 4. Hebrews chapter number 4. So some of this you may be familiar with here in the, the beginning of the sermon. Hebrews chapter number 4, but it's going to get a little bit deeper and we're actually going to start just kind of following a, a, a rabbit trail. So write down some of these, if you will, what these names, these different names mean. So right there in the beginning we saw Jesus and notice that uh, Jesus means Savior and specifically, uh, more expanded, it means Jehovah saves. The J-E there is, is uh, derivative from the name Jehovah and then the end of the word, that is actually the portion of the word that means Savior and we're going to look at that uh, deeper as I said right now. So here in Hebrews chapter number 4 verse number 8 it says this, and we're not going to go over the context. Uh, you can look this up later. It says this, For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. Now I remember in, uh, when I started reading the Bible uh, uh, right at 21, I was reading through cover to cover. I remember that in the book of Acts, Acts chapter number 7, and the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter number 4, I had a lot of trouble. I was just reading on my own and it really bothered me uh, that the name Jesus appeared here. It really gave me trouble that the name Jesus was here and I couldn't understand what it was talking about. I didn't know, I, the story didn't line up with Jesus in the New Testament, you know, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And I knew that it wasn't referring to Jesus, uh, as in the Lord Jesus Christ, so I wasn't you know, familiar or, 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 or positive what particular character that it was talking about. But then I kept studying those two passages, the one in Acts 7 and the one in Hebrews 4, and then I finally, you know, and I was, obviously I was a babe in Christ and didn't know this, and a lot of you obviously know this now. I finally realized that it wasn't talking about Jesus as in the Lord Jesus Christ. It was talking about another person that is named Jesus, and it's someone of the Old Testament. Now, if you look up the name Jesus in the Old Testament, you're not going to find specifically that name Jesus. Just like you're not going to find Jeremiah's. That doesn't appear, but it's the same name as Jeremiah. What name it is, is Joshua. The name Joshua is actually the same name as Jesus. And when you read Hebrews 4 in context, it's very clearly referring to how Joshua led them into the land and gave them rest. When you read Acts chapter number 7, again, it's very clearly talking about Joshua, how he led them into the land, and how he came after Moses. It even talks about how Moses you know, came before him. And, uh, and it ends up making perfect sense you know, that it's speaking about Joshua. And I remember it really bothered me, but then I, I started noticing all of these different things in the Bible, how, how these names will change from Old Testament to New Testament. There's actually you know, a, another person in the New Testament with the name uh, Jesus, uh, you don't actually get to see that person, but he's, at, he's referred to as Bar-Jesus, right? And Bar, we're told in the New Testament, it's also defined for us, means son of. So this man was the son of Jesus. That's what he would be referred to as. There's another man in the New Testament that's called Bar-Jonas. It means son of Jonas. So there was other people at that same time when the Lord Jesus Christ came and was born that had the same name, the name Jesus. And what it was was just the same name of the Old Testament, which was Joshua. Now I want you to go to Numbers chapter number 13 please. Numbers chapter number 13 and I want to dive more into the name Jesus and I want to start picking apart some of these Old Testament Hebrew names. So as I said, you know, uh, all of the Bible is meant for us to learn. You know, the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So that's all Scripture, every single bit of it. You know, everything in the Word of God is Scripture, so we can learn from all of it. We'll learn from every bit of it. Numbers chapter number 13, you know, that's why Jesus said that one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. So every jot, every tittle, every word, every letter matters in the Bible. We should study these things. Yeah, there's other things that are important, but this is important as well. So we should love and reverence all of God's Word. So the word Jesus, as I said, or the name Jesus, I'm sorry, is the same name from the Old Testament that is Joshua. If you study Hebrews 4 and Acts 7, you can conclude that. Um, but I want you to look here at a couple of places. You're in Numbers 13, and I'm going to read to you from Haggai chapter number 1, verse number 12. Haggai chapter number 1, verse number 12, it says this, Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shiltiel, and then it says, And Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. Now, we're not reading the context. Like I said, this is a very different type of sermon tonight. We're just studying the names and studying the words. So I want you to notice the two characters that were mentioned. Zerubbabel, who was the governor, the king at that time. And then we also had Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. Well, if you compare that to the book of Ezra, it's talking about the same time period and talking about uh, the same people. And it says this, Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josedek, and his brethren the priests. And then it says, And Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren. So notice how those, those same characters were mentioned in the Old Testament. They were mentioned in the book of Haggai, and they were mentioned in the book of Ezra. They were men mentioned in both of those books. And in the book of Haggai, you have Joshua. So if you go ahead and write that down if you don't mind. Joshua, the name Joshua. Joshua, the son of Josedek. Joshua was, his, was, uh, was the priest, the high priest, and he was the son of Josedek. And then there was also Zerubbabel. But then it's repeated in Ezra, and, he, and there's a little variation in his name again. And in Ezra chapter 3, verse 2, it says this, Then stood up Jeshua, the son of Josedek. So what is he referred to here as? He's referred to as Jeshua. So notice that this is a variation within the same name. He's referred to as Jeshua here, the son of Josedek, and here he's referred to as Joshua, the son of Josedek. Well, Numbers 13, chapter 13, verse number 16 is very interesting because there's a little change that takes place in Joshua's name. 
which gives him the name Joshua. Look at Numbers chapter number 13, verse number 16. The Bible says this, Then are th th these, I'm sorry, are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. And then it says this, And Moses called Oshia, the son of Nun, Jehoshua. Now, of course, the son of Nun is who? Who is the son of Nun in the Bible? Joshua, we know that. That's the son of Nun. It was Moses' minister. He's also one of the, one of the two spies that were, of these, that were of these tribes here. And uh, if we read, if we actually even, if we were to read the, the chapter in its entirety, we would see that. We would see that Joshua is actually who he is talking about here. So notice that now we have, this gets a little bit complex. That's why I wanted you to notice. So we need to learn these things when we study the Bible. We can learn from this. The name Joshua has a variation which is Jeshua. So make sure you write that down. Joshua is also Jeshua. This is in the Old Testament. His name was originally, <clears throat> and this is a component of that name, Oshia. If, as you see there in Numbers chapter number 13, verse number 16. Oshia. Or it's O, the letter O, S, H, E, A. Oshia. And then his name is changed to Jehoshua. Jehoshua is what it is. Jehoshua. Right? You've heard people in, in, in Hebrew, what do they call, what do they say the name of Jesus in Hebrew? Yahashua. So notice that the, ya, the Y and the J are just being substituted. Right? A lot of people say that they don't believe that that's a legitimate name, but it makes perfect sense when you actually look in the Bible that Jehoshua is Yahshua or Yeshua. Right? So, uh, if you just substitute the Y, you know, that's uh, how languages will change. You know, Jehovah, when they speak Hebrew, is, you know, they'll say Yahweh because one of those letters they don't make the sound. So, uh, so here, notice that it's Jehoshua. Now, what Oshia means, because we know that the J-E refers to what part? Jehovah. That is a, a variation of Jehovah. So, what does Oshia mean? That part of that name is, that is the aspect that is uh, meaning Savior. So his name originally referred to Deliverer or Savior, and then he adds to that name and refers to him as Jehoshua, which now means Jehovah Saves. Jehovah Saves. That is the name Jesus. And that's why he changed his name, because Joshua was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that led them into the land of the Promised Land, uh, the land of Canaan, like Jesus will do to us one day. Right? He'll lead us into the Promised Land. So notice that J-E. So the J-E is interchangeable also with J-O there, with Joshua and Jeshua. I want you to go with me to Hebrews chapter number 7, the New Testament now. Hebrews chapter number 7. Hebrews chapter number 7. So write down there, if you will, that Oshia, that's the part of the name, the component of, the, of Joshua's name that means Savior. Oshia means Savior. The J-E, that is just a shortened or contracted uh, uh, version of Jehovah, which means Lord, Jehovah. We'll get into that too. <clears throat> now the Shua, if you look up Shua, like I said, it means Savior. What we can do is we can take these small components and we can look up Shua. You know, you can get out a Bible search app. You can get on the internet. You know, I, I'll use uh, BibleGateway.com or you can also use King James Bible online. And you can search just letters together. You can search names and all different sorts of things. Uh, uh, find different uh, specific words that are found together in a verse, a Bible verse. You can do all this different research and learn new things from the Bible. And one thing, if you look up that, that ending, the S-H-U-A, which means Savior, you'll find that in many, many names. So you'll find these small little uh, um, you know, uh, uh, components of the Hebrew names kind of swapping out with one another. You'll find them in different names. And one great example is, is many are probably familiar with this, Melchishua, right? You may have heard of Melchishua. Melchishua is one of Saul's sons, you know, King Saul who then you know, was uh, replaced by King David. Well, one of King Saul's sons was named Melchishua. So we know that the end of his name means Savior. Because Oshia, Oshia, right? Uh, uh, <clears throat> because, and the reason why I, I maybe forgot to point this out, but that comes from the variation between Joshua and Jeho uh, uh, Jehoshia, like we saw right there in Jehoshua. Right? So notice that the Shua and the Shia can be interchangeable. Just like Jeshua and Joshua can be used interchangeable, so can Shua and Shea. 
So those are the same. These are all different variations. A lot of the names of the Old Testament are, are overlapping names. So write that down, if you will, as well, that Shua is the same as Shea. We can see that from the name Joshua, right? Shua is the same as the name Shea. So what does that particular portion of the name mean, the component? It means Savior. So we know that the end of Melchizedek's name actually means Savior. It's referring to him as a Savior in some way. Now, uh, so let's look at, and we're going to use that name, Melchizedek, as an example. That's why I brought that up particularly. Melchizedek, we're going to try to define the first part of his name. So we can put these things together and, and learn what these men's names actually mean in its fullest sense. Go to, as I said, Hebrews 7. I'll get there myself. Hebrews chapter number 7. That's in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter number 7. Hebrews chapter number 7. Uh, that first portion of the name uh, Melchi is defined for us. It says this, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. Verse 2, now watch this. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. And now it says this. First, being by interpretation, king of righteousness. So notice that his name first is king of righteousness. Now that is referring to the fact that, his, that he is Melchizedek, right? His name was Melchizedek. But he's also called uh, king of Salem. He's Melchizedek, king of Salem. So Melchi, Melchi there actually means king, is what that means. King. So Melchi, and then Sedek means righteousness. And then you look at the end, it says, and after that also, king of Salem, now notice the pattern, which is king of peace. And then he defines the word Salem for us. So what does the word Salem mean? The word Salem there means peace, exactly. Yeah, the word Salem means peace. So notice that uh, king of Salem means king of peace, and Melchizedek there means king of righteousness. So that first portion of the name Melchizedek means king. The last part, Zedek, means righteousness. And there's also many people that have that ending of their name in the Old Testament, Zedek. So you can write that down. Zedek means righteousness and Melchi means king. So what does Melchi Shua's full name mean? Well, it means king, savior. So maybe it just means that he's the king of the saved. Maybe it means that he's the king and savior in the sense that not in a blasphemous way, but that in a, in a worldly sense, that maybe he was the king of the people at that time in the world. And he was a deliverer and he saved them in that sense like Moses was. So Melchizedek, we can define that full name. So this, I know this is probably a little bit mind-numbing even still and it can be hard to follow, but please try to follow me uh, with this. It's real deep, but that's why I wanted you guys to have a... I can't imagine without a pen and paper. So we define Melchi there. It means king. We define Shua. It meant uh, uh, savior. We define Zedek. Remember there's people in the Bible like uh, Adonai Zedek. Adonai Zedek. So the last portion of Adonai Zedek's name means righteousness, because that's what Zedek means. So you can write that down. Uh, uh, in, the, in the New Testament, it's Zedek with an S. In the Old Testament, it's with a Z. If you look up Melchizedek in the Old Testament, when it refers to this, it's in Genesis 14. And the S is interchanged with a Z. The S is interchanged with a Z. Uh, so I want you to go to the Old Testament with me now. The Old Testament. And I want you to go to, let me have you turn to uh, Genesis chapter 33, verse number 18. <clears throat> you ever heard uh, uh, Hebrew people say shalom? I'm sure you probably have, right? Shalom? You know, it, it's a way of saying hello, but it means peace be with you. That's what it means. Now, just a moment ago, you saw that it said king of peace, right? He was the king of peace, it, which is king of peace when he was interpreting it. But what was he the king of? Salem, right? Well, he was the king of Salem, which is king of peace. So what does Salem mean? It means peace. Salem means peace. The, the word Salem in the Bible is also a variation of that word is Shalem, which is like Shalom, right? Look with me at Genesis chapter number 33, verse number 18. He's talking about the city of Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem, and that's what Salem refers to. You notice at the end of the of the uh, the the name of the city Jerusalem is that those letters S A L E M, King of Salem. 
That man was the king of, of uh, Jerusalem, is what he was the king of. Uh, before it was called Jerusalem, it was just referred to as Salem. It's also referred to as Shalem. Look here in Genesis chapter 33, verse number 18, it says, And Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from, from Padanaram and pitched his tent before the city. If you were to keep reading verse number 19 and on, this is actually where they end up burying Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And where were they buried? They were, of course, buried in the city of Jerusalem, right? Which is Salem, or also known as Shalem. Notice that it's the exact same. Uh, and it's where we get the word shalom, as I said. I want you to notice this even further. This is extremely interesting. Go to Judges chapter number 6, verse number 23. Judges chapter number 6, verse number 23. Once you get there, let me turn there myself. I want you to write down one other thing too. And just kind of take these notes home and look over them. Get there myself. The Old Testament, the book of Judges, Judges chapter number 6. We'll read that in just a moment. I want you to write down one other thing. Uh, that first portion, which I guess you could refer to it as a prefix, a prefix of Melchi, which is M-E-L-C-H-I, that is also used interchangeably with Malchi. Malchi in the Old Testament. The way to, to uh, see that is if you look at 1 Chronicles chapter number 8, verse number 33. And you can also go back and listen to this sermon once it's posted to YouTube. But look up 1 Chronicles 8, 33. It's actually talking about Melchi Shua, and it calls him Malchi Shua. Well, there are numerous people where their name starts with Malchi. Malchia, Malchia Malchira, Malchiah, Malchijah. These are numerous people that, are, that their name starts with Malchi. And we know what that means. Malchi is the same as Melchi which means king. So we can see what Melchi or Malchi means. So you can notice that all, a lot of these names that you may not have noticed are all the same name. A lot of them are just the same name. They're variations. Melchi, Malchi, just same name. Uh, I want to prove to you even further that, that Salem Sh and uh, Shalem is, or I'm sorry, Salem and Shalem is Shalom. I want you to look with me at Judges chapter number 6, verse number 23, and also that it means peace. Look at Judges chapter number 6, verse number 23. The Bible says this, And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Now notice what he said to him. The Lord said, Peace be unto thee. Now look at verse 24. Then, so because of that, Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it, watch this, Jehovah Shalom, or Shalom. Notice that how this time it's not with an E. What does it do? It was before it was Shalem. S-H-A-L-E-M. In the New Testament, it was Salem. S-A-L-E-M. So it's the same place. Jerusalem is the same word, that, that, that ending, that suffix. Salem, S-A-L-E-M, as Shalem, S-H-A-L-E-M. And it's also the same as Shalom. And what did it mean according to Hebrews 7 2? Peace, King of Peace. Why did he call this Jehovah Shalom? Why did he call it Jehovah Shalom? Because the Lord said, Peace be unto thee. That means, you know what Jehovah means? Lord. What does Shalom mean? It means peace. Lord, the Lord said, Peace be unto thee. So you can back that up again and show. There are many people that have the name Shalom even in the Old Testament. Anybody know anybody know the, a guy by the name of Absalom? Do you know what the end of his name means? Peace. You may read over these things, but it's everywhere. You have somebody in the New Testament, Salome, right? You remember Salome? It was, it was also a child of Mary. It was Mary, the mother of James, and Salome. Just added an E to it. It's the same name. It's Salome or Shalom or uh, 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 Shalem was how it was uh, pronounced before. So there we see Jehovah Shalom, right? And we see it means the Lord, the Lord uh, gave peace. Let's look at the name Jehovah now. And we can do you know, more of this study. And this is just giving you a basis of how you can study the Bible on your own. A lot of people are confused about the name Jehovah. They don't know really what the name Jehovah means. So here we see the name Jehovah mentioned. And we can actually learn to define it here, you know, because it tells us in verse 23, and the Lord said. So notice the Lord, and then it says peace. Well, what did he call it? Jehovah Shalom. Uh, Jehovah means Lord. That's what it means. But I'm going to prove that to you. Go to Psalm chapter number 2. 
Psalm chapter number 2. Get that in your left hand. Psalm chapter number 2 <clears throat> in your left hand. And then in your right hand, in the New Testament, get Acts chapter number 4. Acts chapter number 4. Acts chapter number 4. So Acts, Acts chapter number 4, verse number 26, is quoting Psalm chapter number 2, verse number 1. <clears throat> Psalm chapter number 2, look at verse number 1. I believe it's Psalm 2. Is that the right look? It is Psalm 2, right? I think maybe they put it wrong on here. Let me get to the book of Psalms myself. Here, I have it on my sermon notes, but... <clears throat> so... Uh, I'm not going to go to the other places in the book of Psalms where it actually uses the name Jehovah. I'm just going to use Psalm chapter number 2 here. Where you see in all caps the word Lord, that is the name Jehovah. So it says in Psalm 2 verse 2, it says, The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, that's Jehovah, and against His anointed, saying. And then this is quoted in Acts 4.26. And it says, The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. So notice that the word Lord there is found in the New Testament. It's also found in the Old Testament. But in the Old Testament, in Psalm chapter 2, verse 2, the reason why in your King James Bible that each letter, all four letters, is capitalized is because it's referring to Jehovah. That is the name or the word Jehovah. So we can define that by comparing uh, Old Testament scriptures that have the name Jehovah and then New Testament scriptures that quote that. And we can see that it means it clearly is correct. It just uh, basically you know, uh, uh, further proves that it does mean Lord. We can see that here in Psalm 2 and Acts 4. There is, a, there is a variation of the name Jehovah in the New Testament. And this is important. This matters and I'll tell you why. Psalm chapter 68 verse 4 uses this variation. It's only found one time. You don't need to turn there. But it's Jah. It's J-A-H. Jah. Sing unto God. Sing praises to His name. A stole Him that rideth upon the heavens. And then it says, By His name Jah. And rejoice before Him. So this is just a shortened version. It's basically like Joshua. And I'm not talking about in the Bible Joshua. Just how we speak. Right? It would be like if I referred to Joshua, brother Josh, I'm calling him, right? Joshua as Josh, right? He refers to his son as Joshua, but both of their names are, are the same name, right? On your birth certificate, it says Joshua, I'm sure. You know, uh, my uncle that I mentioned this morning in my sermon, his, I call him Joe, but his full name is Joseph. There is no difference. It just may feel uncomfortable to you, or you may not be familiar with it, but there is no difference. The name Jehovah is the same as the name Jah. Just like Joseph is the same name as Joe. They are the same name. It's just a shortened or contracted version. So notice that it's Jah. So what does Jah mean? Jehovah. And what does the word Jehovah, the name Jehovah mean? It means Lord, right? Okay, we'll keep that in mind. We're going to, again, put together two components of a name. So write that down. Jehovah is also Jah. Jehovah is also Jah. And also write down, Jehovah equals Lord. That's what that means. Jehovah equals Lord. We'll go to the New Testament, Matthew chapter number 27. This is actually Jesus Christ speaking. It's when He's on the cross. He's dying on the cross. And He makes a statement while He's dying on the cross. Matthew chapter number 27. Matthew chapter number 27. Look at verse number 46. Matthew chapter number 27, and I said this is Jesus while He's on the cross. He's dying and He cries out and He says this, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. So notice that that's written in uh, Aramaic, which is a, a, a version of Hebrew. It's a very similar language. It's basically Hebrew, right? Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Now God recorded this for a reason. It's not a coincidence that this is in here. And then it says this, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So, I want you to notice that this does matter. Th th these words are in here for a reason. God inspired His Word. He has them written down for us. 
And he could have just said, and Jesus cried out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Couldn't he have just said that? He could have, but he decided to, to actually record the exact words that he spoke at that moment and then translate them for you. And it matters. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani is what he actually spoke. Those are the words that came off of the lips of our Savior's mouth while he was hanging on the cross. And it tells you what they mean. Now if we line this up, what does Eli, Eli mean with the translation? My God. So no, Eli, Eli means God, God, right? Or my God, my God. Now there's someone in the Bible by the name of Elijah, right? There's also someone in this church by the name of Elijah. My son's name is Elijah. His name is Elijah. And there's two components to that name, Eli and Jah, E-L-I. What does E-L-I mean from Matthew 27, 46? My God, right? That's what it means. My God. What does Jah mean? The Lord. The name Elijah, if you look it up, even in a dictionary, they get it correct, but we can define it from the Bible. It means the Lord is my God. That's what the name Elijah actually means. So notice how we can define these words if we spend the time and study and we're a workman. We can define these words in the Bible. The, the name Elijah means the Lord is my God. Now there are a lot of names that start with Eli, right? Elimelech, I mean you, Elisha, you could go on and on and on with all these different names and start with Eli. Now you know what the word Eli means. You can go ahead and write that down if you don't mind. Eli means my God. That's what that means, referring to God, right? Jah means Jehovah. So any name that ends with Jah, you know that this means the Lord. Every single name. So don't you notice how all of these words are just used interchangeably uh, uh, over and over and over again. It'll just swap out Amen. the different uh, components. And you can basically understand what every single name in the Bible means. You can do the study and the work for yourself, and I believe that you could know what every single name in the Bible means. It's very interesting. Go to Genesis chapter number 4, verse number 25. Genesis chapter number 4, verse number 25. Now, I left out, because this is like, I understand this is a sermon like probably you've never heard. It's way different. than It's super heavy. It's a lot of teaching and, and, and stuff, and it's very intricate. I left out a lot of stuff so that to make sure, and that's why I said, hey, get him a pen and paper. I've never done that before either. Because, you know, uh, uh, it's a lot of information. I want you to be able to process and think about it later. But uh, we can learn from these types of things. I want to show you another example of this. Look at Genesis chapter number 4, verse number 25. It says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom, claim, who, whom Cain slew. So we get the definition of the name Seth here. It says, For God, this is why she called him Seth. She called him Seth because, it said, said she, God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel. What the, the, uh, the name Seth means is appointed in someone's stead or replacing someone. Appointed or ordained or anointed in someone's stead. So you can write that down if you don't mind. Seth means appointed in someone's place or appointed into someone's stead. That's what that means. Instead of another or place of another. Now if you look at 1 Chronicles chapter number 1, verse number 1, the genealogy is given from Adam and Eve. And when it mentions Seth, his name is Sheth. S-H-E-T-H. I hope you're starting to understand how common names are changed and how common they vary throughout the Bible. Every single name practically, unless it's only mentioned a couple of times, will be mentioned again a little bit different with a little bit different spelling. This is very common all throughout history in all writings. We may not do this in, in, in 20, you know, uh, 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 2020 America, I almost said 2019, 2020 America, but most cultures do this in their writings. Most, cult, most cultures do this in their language. In English, it was done in the past. And uh, this is very common in the Bible's writings, very common in Hebrew and in Greek, where names are just a little bit different. They'll just change the spelling a little bit. They have variations of the names. Seth is also chef. Please write that down. Seth is also chef. And that it, you can figure that out by looking at the genealogy of Seth in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 1. He's mentioned as chef. Now, Seth comes up in the Bible uh, uh, in variate, or I'm sorry, in names, uh, in four different names. 
Seth, I'm just giving you, this is just meant to be as an example. There's no specifics about Seth himself. I just figured I'd find a name early on that's defined in the Bible. Seth in Genesis, is mentioned in Genesis 4.25 where we're at. Then there's Sether, which is Numbers 13.13. Kir Hariseth, which is in 2 Kings 3.25. And Pibaseth, which is in Ezra, or Ezekiel, I'm sorry, that's Ezekiel 30, 17. There is no, that's how I knew, there is no, I just put EZ and I noticed 30, so that's not Ezra. Ezra doesn't have that many chapters. Ezekiel 30, 17 is Pibaseth. Now, every time you see S-E-T-H coming up, you know what that means? Appointed in the stead of. That's what their name means. Appointed in the stead of. That's a portion of their name. Then you compare it to, and then you need to find out what the other component of their name is. Well, as I mentioned, Sheth is used interchangeable with Seth when you see the genealogy in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 1. Sheth is the same name as Seth. Now, Sheth is very common. It's extremely common throughout the Old Testament. Uh, Sheth is in Numbers 24, 17. Sheth is in Judges 19, 11, De Deba Sheth. Judges 4, 2 is Harasheth. But then listen to this. 2 Samuel 2, 8 is uh, Ishbosheth. So notice that that's the same name as Seth. Ishbosheth. And the, that last portion of his name means appointed in the stead of, or put into the place of. Ishbosheth. What about this? Mephibosheth. Right? Sheth is the same name as Seth. And it means appointed in the place of. Right? You can uh, keep looking these up and comparing them. Je, uh, uh, Jerubasheth is in 2 Samuel 11, 21. Sheth itself, as I said, in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 1. It's also mentioned in a few other forms in the book of Ezra and Micah. So we see this over and over and over again. I want to give you another example of how the Bible defines names for you. Go to uh, uh, Genesis chapter 17, verse 5. We're given the name of Jacob. Uh, we're given the name of, of many different people in the Bible. Jacob means supplanter, it tells us. Uh, I want you to look here at, we're going to look at a very famous person in the Bible and we're going to end right here because like I said, I understand this is a lot of, this is a lot of information and it's kind of ob an obtuse subject you may haven't thought about a lot. It's, we, you know, words and names that don't flow off of the tongue very smoothly, you know, when you uh, speak uh, uh, contemporary English like we speak. Right here in Genesis 17, we're given what the name Abraham means. Now, Abram means uh, uh, father. And his name is changed from Abram to Abraham, which means many nations. So Abraham means father of many nations. There's a lot of people that have the ham ending in their name. Their name ends with H-A-M. Do you know what that means? Many nations or nations. That's what it means. Look at uh, Genesis 17, chapter 17, verse 5. The Bible says, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham for, meaning because, a father of many nations have I made thee. Now before that his name already meant father, but what was the change? This is how to define which part means father and which part means nations. What was the change that, of why God changed his name. What was the reason of why God changed his name? Look at verse 4. As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. What was the promise that was given to him? That he was going to be a father of many nations. So that was the change. I want you to notice that. That was the change. He was going to be the father of many nations. So that ham part that was added on, his name was originally Abram, meant many nations. That was the covenant. So his name means father of many nations. Every time you see Abra or uh, uh, Abram in the Bible in a different form, it means father. Ham means many nations. refers to a lot of nations, a multitude, right? There's many other different words in the Bible like, uh, you know, uh, I don't have the verse uh, 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 references for these, the Bible references for these. And you could go ahead and write that down if you like. Abram means father. Ham means nations or many nations. But uh, Jacob we're told that, that he's referred to as Jacob, and actually, uh, this is brought up from Esau, his brother. He says he is rightfully named Jacob. Why? Because he has supplanted me these two times. Now, supplant means to, like, deceive, right? To take something from someone that doesn't belong to them. So what does Jacob mean? Jacob means, what that means, was it falling or something? Oh, oh gotcha. Yeah, Jacob means... Uh, uh, supplanter, or it's very similar to the word deceiver. So that's what the word Jacob means. Remember what Jacob's name was changed to? Does anybody remember? Just kind of Israel. Does anybody remember what Israel means? Prince. Prince. It tells you. So 
we can figure out what you know and these names are used as I said they're in they're in their built-in components there are they're like these different uh, they're like uh, these blends right that's basically what they are you know how the children learn blends of just a couple of letters together you know they're like root wor words and a prefix and a suffix how Latin is laid out like ology in a, in a word a, a Latin based word in English means the study of bio means life so it's the study of life we're basically doing the exact same thing with the Bible. You have in the English text, the King James Bible, you have it defining for you in all different places by comparing Scripture with Scripture. Now you may figure it out by figuring out, hey, that's the same name as that, Seth and Sheth. So, every, so then Seth is defined for you, but now every time you see Seth and Sheth both, you know what that means. And Sheth is very common. It may be defined for you like in Matthew 27, 46. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it's Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, right? It may, you, so there's different ways. Hebrews 7, it defined for us again what the word uh, Melchizedek meant. And Melchi is an extremely common prefix in names. You know, you can see these. And Malchi, remember that the A and the E will you know, be used interchangeable sometimes. So it's the same name. So I believe, and I just cut this short, it's not like I ran out of material. There is so, so much in the Bible where you can just learn, where the names are defined for you. Mara. Did anybody remember what Mara means? Bitter. That's found in two places in the Bible. In the book of Numbers, when the waters are bitter and they throw in the wood, they said they called it Mara because it was bitter. And then Ruth, in the book of Ruth, right? Uh, they return, and uh, uh, who is it that says it? It's, it what, I'm sorry? I couldn't hear you. Naomi. Naomi, yeah, Ruth's mother. That's why I couldn't, I couldn't think of Naomi for a moment. Yeah, Ru Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, says, Call me no longer Naomi, which means pleasant or good, and you can tell that from the text, but call me Mara, you know, because the Lord hath dealt very bitterly with me. So what does Mara mean? Bitter. Mara is found in a lot of words in the Bible. I believe personally, and this is not in here accidentally, God spent time and put this here for you, and you may think, oh, this feels like a waste of time. No, you're commanded to study the Bible, all of it. All of it is given by inspiration of God. It says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. A-L-L, -L, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. All of it's profitable, every single bit of it. And that means the studying of words. That means the studying of names. God included everything that we need in this book so that we don't have to go to another reference. Because you know what happens when you go to the dictionary? You can be deceived. The dictionary, that's man's words. That's man's book. And it'll, it'll, it'll confuse you and give you the wrong definitions. But what God did was he, he built in a dictionary here, not only for just regular words, but also for names. Oftentimes, if you look up the first time that a word appears in the Bible, it'll define itself. You know, like in Genesis 1, he called the, wa he called, you know, the waters that were gathered together, he called them seas. Now, what are the he called the gathering together of waters seas. That's the exact quote. What is a sea? It's the gathering together of waters. Notice what he did. He called, you know, he called the, uh, uh, the light uh, day and the darkness he called night. Right? He's just In Genesis 1, the first time these words are mentioned, it's on a very basic level. He's just defining every word. Right? Also, he defines names even for you. And you can study these things and learn from them. It's much deeper. But hey, it's profitable. All of the Bible is profitable. I figured it would be interesting just to show you how deep the Bible is. That just, if you spend your time, if you dig down in it and you compare even names, you can find the definitions and you can build upon that and just continue to compare these things and kind of follow a rabbit trail. So, uh, you know, this, I hope that this compels you to study God's Word. I hope that this compels you, you know, to, to know how deep it is. And what it can do is, and this is what, you know what I noticed when I started doing this? Like, man... I know very little about the Bible. When I started looking up all of these different names, I've never heard it taught or preached by anybody. I realized, man, I don't know very much about the Bible. You know, I don't know very much about what these names meant. I had no idea that Malchi was the same name as Melchi. I had no idea that Seth was the same name as Sheth. These are things that I just recently learned, right, by comparing Scripture with Scripture. And what it should show you is there is a lot in this book. Amen. And it should compel you to spend more time studying it and to love it more and to, to see that God gave you everything you need. He built all these things into it. So you have your own dictionary inside of God's Word. Be thankful for God's Word. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your Word, as I said. We thank you for everybody that came out tonight, dear Lord, the visitor and everyone else, dear God. We ask you you bless us all, dear Lord. Help us to love your Word. Help us, dear God, to have good fellowship, to enjoy the food. 
And we ask you that you just be with us, dear Lord. Bless us throughout this week and keep us safe. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.